day to you all. I'm Thomas Marshall and I'm the maester cook to King James V here at the magnificent Stirling Castle. Today we're going to take a closer look at the castle kitchens or the great kitchens as they're known. So come a wall Ben, we'll have a wee look around eh? charge of dozens of people here in the castle. I give the orders. The kitchens are like my own wee castle and I'm the boss. Well, that doesn't mean to say I'm afraid to get my hands dirty. As the Royal Maester Cook here at Stirling, my reputation is vital and it's important that my staff learn from me. It is a royal kitchen after all. So why not download our Busy Castle Kitchen Scene Activity Sheet from our website? Add all the items you see as we go along in our tour. Have you ever been to our castle kitchens before? Well, don't worry if you haven't. Just come with me and I'll show you around. As you can see, the Royal Kitchens are pretty dark inside. No fancy light switches here, it's mostly candles. So we try and make the most of the daylight. It's much better in here in the summer than it is in the winter. And did you know that the candles would actually be made and stored within a special department right here in the kitchens? You do now, thank me later. Hello again. On fast days, that's the days where we don't eat meat, we substitute it with fish. Salmon, trout, cod, turbot, shellfish, most of them you will have heard of. Some of them, you might know it. Look at all the fish hanging here. We're using smoke to preserve them. Bridges or freezers in my time. Look at all these chickens roasting in front of the fire, slowly going round and round. We do that so they don't burn or char. I'm going to get a wee tray to put under them to gather all the juices. We can use that to baste them later to keep them nice and moist. Did you know? that on Fridays and during Lent, the 40 days leading to Easter, we don't eat meat. Instead, we'd eat fish and vegetables. And speaking of Lent, 
I've got a delicious recipe for you to try. However, on the days that meat is on the menu, the Royal Household would be offered beef, mutton, lamb. And speaking of which, we've got a recipe for that too. This is very tough. It's really hot in here. Great in the winter time. Not so much today. You may have noticed this wee laddie turning the crank handle around and round. That's for the meat to be roasted slowly in front of the fire. He's maybe only about eight, maybe ten at the moment, maybe ten. And he's this strong leather jerkin here to protect him a wee bit for the heat. He's what we call in the Scots language a turnbrokey. Can you imagine at the ages of eight or ten having to do a job like this? Day after day, turning the meat around and around and around and around, over and over again. Somehow, I don't think so. There's lots of jobs here at the castle, which today might be considered overstaffed and very bureaucratic. For example, there's nine people who look after the pewter and the silver plates here in the castle. They are very valuable, of course, and they have to be kept in the top condition. After all, we don't want the king and the queen being the subject of men's gossip about the poor state of their plates, do we? The answer is no. I'm wondering, do any of you have certain plates or dishes at home that only get used in special occasions? I bet you do. Although I'm the master cook here at Stirling, it's not my job to look after the silver and pewter plates. And behind me is a cupboard. You'll have some of these at home, no doubt. It's where we store cups and plates, among other things today. The board part of the word used to mean table, a storage place, hence cup, board or cupboard. Excuse me, handsome young man, can I have some pewter dishes for the Great Hall feast later today, please? Certainly, young man, here are some pewter dishes you can use in the Great Hall feast later today. Oh, all the ingredients for the food to be cooked were kept here in the pantry. Pantry comes from the old Latin word panai, which was a place to store bread. But pretty soon, pantries became a place where you stored lots of ingredients. And here in the great kitchens at Stirling Castle, there were three people in charge of giving out the ingredients to my cooks, including me, the cheek of it. I'm a master cook, you can. And this is where the spices are kept. And you've guessed it, even more people in charge of them. What's this place like? And here we would keep Things like nutmegs, cloves, ginger, pepper, cinnamon, and so on. They're all very, very expensive. And they're not grown in Scotland. We import them from places like Africa, India, the Far East, and even more places. Now, of course, mustard is easily grown in Europe, and quite possibly here in Scotland too. So they were used in great amounts in dishes. Oh, too hot for me. And Sir Andrew Wood, the great shipbuilder and sailor, his ships would leave Scotland and travel the seas for two years or more, and they would come back laden with all sorts of exotic goodies. And of course, not everyone could afford them, so they're kept under lock and key. Oh, saw that racket up there. Oh, my goodness, this wee laddie has dropped a jug of milk and it's spilt all over the floor. Look at the yeoman cook. Look at his snarly face. He looks a rick crabbit. I hope the wee boy avoids a scalp at lug or he will be crying over spilt milk. At least the cat's enjoying it. Well, let's get this place cleaned up. 
Well, thank you for joining us and we hope you've enjoyed your tour of the Great Kitchens here at Stirling Castle. Why don't you come down and join us today to see what we're cooking up? Cheery for now. So let's get started on the feast. If you're cooking the same dishes as us, you can find the recipes on Historic Scotland's website. I think that's something to do with spiders. Behind me are the huge baking ovens, sometimes referred to as bread ovens, but they do more than just bread. Bread was a very important food in times gone past. It was our main source of calories. That's the stuff that gives us energy. The main sort of bread in my time was pan common or ordinary bread. This was a small, light, brownish loaf and you would only get one of these a day. You could use this bread to soak up all the juices from your plate as butter could sometimes be hard to come by. Now our king and queen would have access to plenty of butter and they would also have small white rolls, the kind you get with your soup today. These would be made by a specialist baker, like myself. Bread is relatively easy to make, but it is a little time consuming. Now I suppose that you get your bread today from supermarkets, but in the 16th century, we don't have supermarkets. Now here in the castle kitchens, the staff would awake very early every day so we can get the ovens fired up. This would mean raking out the cold ash from the day before's preparation before resetting the fire with fresh wood. It's very dangerous to leave a fire burning overnight unattended. In fact, some castles had the bread ovens separate from the main buildings for that very reason. As a master cook, I'm not a bin getting my horns mock at myself, you can. I wouldn't send a man to do a job, I wouldn't do myself. And did you know that that ash would then be taken and mixed with grease and water to make soap that we wash ourselves with. You do now. So that's the ovens heating up nicely there. It's now time to prepare a dish for the diners. Today, we're going to make a tart out of Lent. You may know it simply as a cheese tart. The reason we sometimes refer to it as a tart out of length is because the ingredients we're going to use, cheese, butter, eggs, cream, are not allowed to be eaten during that period of Lent in the run up to Easter. It's remarkably simple, but very, very tasty. And if you are going to make a tart out of Lent or any of the other dishes we're going to cook today, please share them with us on social media, whatever social media is. So let's have a go, shall we? For the pastry, you're going to need 300 grams of flour, 180 grams of butter, eggs, pinch of salt, and two tablespoons of water. And for the filling, 100 grams of hard cheese, such as Dunlop, 150 milliliters of double cream, and 30 grams of butter. Now the first thing you should do is set your oven to 200 
or 100 native it's a fan or gas mark 6. Now my ovens don't have fancy gauges on them but from my years of baking experience I know when my ovens are good to go. In fact some of my bakers when they were learning would actually throw flour onto the floor of the oven and if it turned black but didn't set fire the temperature was just right. Take your flour, add it into your bowl, get your butter, your cube butter, place it in with the flour, take a pinch of salt, put it in and then start to rub the flour and the butter together through your fingertips until it resembles almost like breadcrumbs. Add two tablespoons of water and if your mix looks a wee bit dry, don't worry, you can always add a little water at a time. Mix it all in the bowl until you have a nice ball of dough, just like this. Then we scatter some flour on the table and then we just start to knead the dough for a minute or so. Cover your ball of dough and leave to the side. I'm going to put this in the pantry. You might want to put it in your fancy fridge if you have one. And now for the yummy filling. I'm using Dunlop cheese, which is made in the Dunlop dairy near Kilmarnock. It's my favourite cheese other. You can use other hard pressed cheeses if you like, but this is actually one of the oldest known cheese recipes in Scotland. And I prefer it because not only is it historic, but it's incredibly tasty. Now, I've cut my cheese up. You can use grated cheese if you like. This has got to be pressed down into a paste. But as I said, grated cheese is a lot easier and takes out a lot of the hard work. Now add your egg. your butter and your cream. And then mix it all together. And don't worry if your mix looks a little too wet, you can always add more cheese. And if it's too dry, you can always add a little more cream. And back to the pastry. We call it a coffin, I suppose you might put dead stuff in it. Now you can use your pie dish, no fancy dishes for us Stuart cooks. I'm doing mine by hand the traditional way. Once you've lined your tin, you'll put your ingredients in. I'm going to set my pie with what we call crimping. Just simple pinching the pastry up. Two fingers over one. Then we'll put our filling in and get it in the oven. To your mix, add it to your coffin, plenty of it, get it in there and make sure you press it right down to the bottom and into the edges and you'll then take your lid, place it over the top and crimp in your lid. You'll then take your beaten egg, brush it over, this will give it a nice finish in the oven. So we cook in the oven for about 30 to 40 minutes. Francois, c'est vous plaît? So while the tart is baking, 
Let's go over to Peg and see what she's preparing for today's feast. A good day to you all, my lords and ladies, and welcome. My name's Peg, and I'm one of the very few women that work here in the Royal Kitchens. Are you enjoying yourself getting organised for the great feast? What have you planned to put on your plate tonight? Let us know in the comments. As you can see, the kitchens are really busy and never more so than when there's a great feast. Everything has to be planned well in advance. There's no fast food around here, you know. If you haven't planned what you're gonna have for your tea tonight, then I can show you a very simple dish that you can easily make. The only thing is the name's a wee bit rude. They're called farts of Portingale. So the first thing you're going to need will be some mutton. Or if you can't get mutton, then lamb will do the job very nicely indeed. These are raisins of currants, what you would call currants, and wonderful dates all the way from the Mediterranean. We're going to use mace, and most people don't know what mace is or where it comes from. It's part of the nutmeg. We're all familiar with the nutmeg, the kernel of the nut. It comes inside a hard outer casing and then covering that hard outer casing there is a fibrous part and this is the mace. So it's a very thrifty spice when you think about it. You get two for the price of one. These are cloves. They have a very strong pungent flavour so we'll only use a little bit of that one. Our third ingredient is pepper but we have options where pepper is concerned. Most people are familiar with black pepper the king of peppers, that lovely, sharp, hot fieriness that you get from it. But we have options here. And today, instead of using black pepper, I'm going to use one of those others that we have available. This is long pepper. It has a very earthy aromatic to go with the fire. These are cubeb peppers. Again, they have a fairly earthy aromatic along with the fire. But the one I've chosen to use today are these. This is Grains of Paradise, and they have a wonderful sweet aromatic that goes wonderfully well with the sweetness of the currants and the dates. First thing to do is to prepare your meat. It needs to be chopped up very, very fine, and then ground down so that you've got a nice, fine paste. It takes a wee while to get it all cut up nice and fine, and then pop it into a mortar and get a grand pestle and give it a good grind down. I'll just show you a wee bitty so that you're not gonna get bored with me doing it. You take a wee bit of time at home, and of course you might get somebody to do it for you. It'd be so much easier if you do it. Be very careful not to cut your fingers for goodness sake. Now these wonderful dates have a stone inside them which you need to take out. It's very, very easy. Just split them with a knife and then take the stone out and lay it aside. Now, they're quite tough and they take a wee bit of effort to, to do. So just take your time and make sure that your knife is nice and sharp. And you want to cut them up nice and small so that when you make the meatballs, a little bit of taste goes into every one. So we have our meat and dates in the bowl. We add our currants. And then our spices. So the spices come whole and need to be ground so that we can be used. So one or two cloves, a little pepper, some mace, a little salt and some mortar and then grind them down with a pestle. That takes a good bit of elbow grease and it takes a little while to do. So just to make life easier, I prepared some earlier and we have our spices ready to go in in the bowl here, a little bit of salt, our mace, cloves and pepper. And this is where you get your hands in because they're by far the best way of mixing anything. Get your hand into the bowl and squeeze it all together and get it to mix. Now this is probably the hardest bit and it's still very easy. You need to make little balls from your mixture about the size of a decent sized nutmeg. That's maybe a wee bit big. About that sort of size. Make as many as you can out of your mix. And when you've got it all used up, then you need a nice pan of boiling beef stock. And these are simply dropped in and left to boil 
for about 10 minutes or thereabouts. And you know when they're ready, because when you put them in at first, they'll all sink to the bottom of the pan. And then after about 10 minutes or so, you'll see them start to rise up to the top and stay there. And that tells you that they're cooked and ready to come out. Then just take them all out with a draining spoon, pop them someplace to stay warm while you get them organized onto a dish and ready to serve. And that's you done. So it couldn't really be any easier, could it for you? Using a large spoon, gently lower your farts into the boiling stock. They'll cook in about 10 minutes. When they're cooked, put them on a serving plate and eat them with a honey mustard dip. You could add these to your feasting plate. Oh, what's that you've got there? This peg is a tart out of Lent. It's just this moment finished bacon. Not only does it smell delicious, it tastes delicious. Now let me just inspect what you've been working on there, Peg. Aye, very good. Right, Peg, let's get these up to the Great Hall and prepare for the feast. Welcome back. You're just in time. And if you're just joining us, don't worry, you can catch up with all the preparations for the Royal Feast in the Great Hall here today on Historic Scotland's YouTube channel. But anyway, back to the feast. In 1530, scholar Erasmus from Southern Holland wrote a treaty on table manners as he thought people were getting ruder and ruder. And here are some of those instructions. Always wash your hands before eating. Don't rest your elbows on the table. Don't start your meal by drinking heavily. Don't pick your teeth with your knife or fingernails. Please sir, table manners, where do you think you are? And the guide goes on and on and on. But you didn't come here to be lectured on the rules. You came here for this. Look at this wondrous feast. The king and queen live a lavish lifestyle. All of this wonderful food isn't just a display of culinary taste, it's an expression of wealth and generosity. A feast here in Stirling Castle's Great Hall could hold up to three or four hundred people at one time. Can you imagine how long this would have taken to prepare? And as you can see, the top table is dressed with fine cloth and each place has a knife and a spoon. No forks yet. There would also be containers for beer and wine. The wine, red and white, would only be served to the high status guests and diners. And the beer, to all. The beer was pretty weak, so you could probably drink lots of it without getting drunk. For the top table to look as grand as this, the maester cook, <coughs> that's me, would present the dishes onto the table one by one and take a bow. There would even be a royal taster to make sure that the food is safe. Mmm, magnifique. Only after the King and Queen have been served would the food be passed down the tables. Can you imagine how hungry you would be waiting for all that food to get to you if you're way down the bottom? So let's take a closer look at some of the dishes that have been served up. For those of you who tuned in earlier, you will remember this wonderful tart out of Lent. 
Another dish you might recognise is this jelly here. Wibble, wobble, wibble, wobble. This jelly would have taken several pig's feet to be boiled up for about eight or nine hours to extract the gelatine in them. Then it would be strained through a cloth for about two hours. Then it would have had wine and spices added to it. And then finally taken to a cool place to set overnight. I wonder how long your jelly takes to make. Thankfully, not all dishes take over a day to make. Take this liver pudding, for example. Now, liver is a byproduct of the animal. You know, it's awful. And it's discarded a lot these days, but it's really delicious. And have you ever heard the expression to eat humble pie? Which sometimes mean you've been brought down a peg or two, or you're not as rich as you make out. That comes from the old word for awful, called umbles. Humble, humble pie. There's nothing awful about this awful. See what I did there? Awful and, and awful. Oh, oh, never mind. And speaking of awful jokes, here's some farts <coughs> of Portingale. And if you tuned in earlier, you would have learned how to make these. They're not called farts because they make your bottom butt. They're called farts because they're made of farce meat, an old word meaning force meat. But that's not really funny, is it? <coughs> Let's take a look at some other dishes. The Turnbrokey's hard work has resulted in moist roast chickens. Spinach fritters with cinnamon and a custard tart with sugared pansies. In the Renaissance period, you eat with your eyes as well as your mouth. And sugar in our time was equivalent to about 40 to 50 pound for a kilo. And today, you can probably buy it for less than one pound. And some of your guests will know that sugar is a sign of wealth and status and that they might not actually get to partake in these sweet treats. And here we have the king of the seas, Neptune, with his mighty trident. And a wee unicorn with a gilded horn resting, just like the tapestry here in the palace, all made of marzipan. These sugar dishes are time consuming and very costly. So only a few very specially selected guests would be invited to what we call a banquet after the feast. But you could be getting sweetened up. This ship, these plane cars, and these cannons are entirely made of sugar. And did you know that in 1594, James VI had a huge feast here in Stirling Castle for the baptism of his son? Well, you do now. A five meter long boat was wheeled in in front of the guests and people threw out fishes and crabs that were actually made of marzipan and sugar. How extravagant is that? I don't know about you, but I'm starving and I can't wait to tuck in to this lovely food. We hope you've enjoyed yourself with us today, so please let us know in the comments and send in your pictures of your feast. Mm -hmm.